principals oversee the day-to-day -day life of their schools, but just what that entails has shifted over the years. Many now report that instead of focusing on education and guiding the professional development of their staff, they're bogged down in administrative work. Joining us now on that and the impact that's having on students, Annalisa Varano. She is president of the Catholic Principals Council of Ontario and a principal with the Simcoe Muskoka Catholic District School Board. And we're glad you could spare some time for us at TVO tonight. Thank you very much. Just Steve. tell Thanks us, what are, your, what are your main duties as a principal? Well, as you know, I think historically principals uh, were seen as the authoritative figure, a disciplinarian, mm -hmm. somewhere that you went to when you were in trouble. And I think that that's evolved over time. And, uh, um, you know, the teacher is seen, was seen historically, too, as that driver of success. But more and more, they're seeing principals as um, really impactful on student achievement and student success. And so we see the role, like we love to see the role as uh, a, a way of really impacting change in schools. And so we are change leaders, we are servant leaders. How and long have you been doing it for? I've been a principal, uh, well I started as a vice principal in 2006 and so I've been a principal for the last nine years since 2010. Okay. So. How much of your job, I don't know if you can sort of give us a ratio how much of your job is dealing with paperwork and staffing and all of that stuff that's probably less interesting and how much of it is actually direct interaction with students? Well, like again, the goal is always to interact with the students and to be out there in the halls and to be constantly mm -hmm. communicating with them and to even working with staff on how to um, drive that instructional agenda. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's right, the door is always open and so we have to deal with the issues that come at hand on any particular day. And with that comes a, a lot of paperwork and uh, long hours of trying to get everything completed so that, uh, you know, we can engage in some of the most, those more important roles. Because you've got to be present, right? You've got to be seen. The students yeah. have to see you doing your thing. That's right. And is that harder nowadays? It's, it's significantly harder to be visible. So to get out uh, in the hallway, <laughs> you know, I'm in a secondary school to get out to the hallway uh, often uh, times in right from that, you know, 10 or 15 things are going to come up while you're out there. And so then next thing you know, you're in your office. However, parents are walking into the office at all times. Uh, there's uh, staff issues, human resources, mm. um, budget responsibilities, allocation of resources, demands of, of people, wa you know, wanting things as the day goes on. And so we have to uh, pay attention to those things as well. How much good old-fashioned, uh, I'm going to use an expression here that I know you don't do, but for the lack of, yeah, it's what's in my head. How much headbutting do you do of students, you know? Breaking up fights and just all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, quite a bit. Uh, yeah. You know, dealing with student issues is one of the uh, major parts of the day-to-day -day of the job. Uh, I'm very thankful that I've always had a vice principal in the school I've been at, so it's also assisted me in some of that interaction. But it really is about building relationships, Steve, so I, I really believe that. Uh, the more of relationships, the better relationships that we build with the students, uh, the better um, the behavior becomes in the school. If they, it's about setting expectations for them, and my expectations have always been very high, and so uh, I believe that you know to set the goal high, and students will achieve that. And so they, un they once they get to know you, they un they understand what you expect of them, and uh, the the behavior starts to change. Uh, I wonder how much more difficult it is as well, because, and I know from my own kids' examples. Uh, you know, it seemed, it seemed like there, there's a new principal coming in every three years or something <laughs> like that at the school. Mm. Is it tougher to try to do what you need to do when you're on the move as much as many of you are nowadays? And so that's a great point because, uh, you know, it's very important when you start off um, as a principal in a school to really take the time and understand historically what has gone on. And so once you get um, to understand that, which could take a year to really understand uh, you know, just the culture of the school and the history, the the the, um, the parent community, the students, getting to know the students. And so once you're ready to start to really impact some change, then oftentimes you can be moved. <laughs> so that does significantly yeah. impact your efforts, um, but also just, you know, things progressing in the school as well. Let's talk about another thing that, that has really been on a lot of people's minds lately, and that is, I'll, I'll reference a 2018 report by People for Education, mm -hmm. found that principals like you spending a large chunk of their time, maybe more than ever, on mental health issues. How does that play out in your daily work? 
So yes, you know, increasing amount of students and staff and families that are struggling with mental health issues. And so that, uh, as a principal, is uh, challenging um, for many reasons. I mean, we are in constant communication with community partners on the telephone all the time, making those connections, trying to find assistance for students that are in crisis. Um, also, um, the stress and impact of the job is affecting teachers and educational assistants on the job, and so therefore they're going off on leaves. And so it inhibits us from putting the most qualified people in front of those students at that time. So uh, lots of um, issues with um, just absences and, you know, even in the morning sometimes I will get to work and, you know, five or six people may be off at any given time. Five or six teachers? Yeah. In uh, you and mean that's that's you would get a call you'd get calls from maybe five teachers in one day or something yeah so like that? we have every day is a part of that job is uh, getting to work uh, quite early to check the absence report to make sure all the jobs have been filled and in many cases they have not been filled because there is a shortage that way too of uh, having enough uh, supply teachers or people that are qualified to be in those positions to come in um, and oftentimes uh, we are left to do the supervision. Well, tell me this, if you get a teacher coming to you and uh, saying something like, you know, this is just way, way tougher nowadays and I think I'm gonna crack, I gotta get out of here. Mm -hmm. what, what, how do you react to that? What do you do? Well, uh, we, we try really hard to just support the teacher in whatever that they need. And I mean, uh, if they're coming to us and they're having significant issues with dealing, we want to make sure that we're supporting them. Uh, we're supporting them with parents, I mean, uh, and supporting them with their students as well. And, and just trying to find strategies and ways on how we can do that. And then, um, you know, oftentimes that they, they decide that perhaps it is uh, beneficial for them to take some time. Um, you know, off, and so then we're in a position where we, we do need to, to fill that position as now, well. So. Would you be the point person if a student is suffering from mental health issues? Yes, yeah, so there is an intake process, so we, we do, because we, we do have board, like psychologist support and guidance counselors, but it's not enough, like we do need more supports from the community, so I am in constant contact with those community partners. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we are uh, suggesting those partners to our staff as well if we need to. Let's talk class size. Mm -hmm. What advice? You've met the Minister of Education, right? I have. The new Minister of yes, Education? I have, yes. Did you talk to him about class size? We certainly what, did, yes. What was your advice to him on that? So, um, we, with, with increased class size, becomes a reduction in staff in the building, so supervision for students in the building. It's also, we have to cut programming to adjust to that, those ratios. And so we talked about the formula. And so the formula that is now suggested at 22 and a half doesn't necessarily uh, filter down to the, the ground level that nicely. So oftentimes our class sizes are increased uh, to 34, 35 students in some of our academic classes. I gave him some examples about how uh, if I am running four or five math sections uh, that are filled with over 35 students, at that point, it's not responsible to do that. So I'll open up a sixth section to take some pressure off those five mm -hmm. sections. But, but at then the you expense, need another teacher I, then. I know I have to close another section because right. we're only given so many ah. teachers, right? So Is this with, in the secondary panel? You get 35, yes. 35 students in a secondary class. There has been many, yes, cases now. I'm sure the numbers are gonna come in this week to indicate, but I know that some of my colleagues are really struggling with uh, increased class size, mm -hmm. the ratios for that. So unfortunately, if you have to open up another section of those academic or math or mandatory classes, you have to close other sections and a lot of times the electives get hit. And those are the ones, those are the courses that the kids really need. For example? For example, the automotive trade, the construction courses, the hospitality courses, the arts. So those are the ones that will unfortunately have to be reduced in order, because they're not necessarily mandatory courses. There is one mm. mandatory arts course, but. What's the advice you gave him as to, in your view, the best way out of that conundrum? Well, <laughs> the best way out of the conundrum is to, is to leave and not reduce class size, basically. Um, is that an option? I don't know at this time, uh, but I know that he's taken it under advisement. We've t we had a really great conversation. You mean not increase class size? And not to, sorry, to, yeah. to leave it as is, right. <laughs> to gotcha. not to increase it. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also talked about how the impact of staffing is. So right now, we cannot replace uh, retired teachers uh, because we are trying to get up to that 28 threshold. And so- 28 if, students per class. Correct. 
on average, on as average. an average. Across the board. Right. Across the board. Right. And so with that, for example, if your physics teacher retires, you cannot hire a new physics teacher. Um, you can't post for a new position because we're not replacing the retirees at this point. So what do you do? So we try to utilize the staff that you have in the building to, uh, and therefore, there may be some lack of specialization in that regard. So that has how it impacts students. Are you gonna because have you're not English? getting the right person in front of the student. So is it theoretically possible you're gonna have an English teacher teaching physics? Well, yes, you, you know, try your hardest to find somebody that is, uh, you know, perhaps in the math field or, or something closer to it than English, mm -hmm. but yes, that could happen. So in your view, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but in your view, the changes that the current government is bringing forward will have an adverse impact on students. Yeah, like it's our responsibility to actualize the priorities of the government. That's our job. Mm -hmm. And so, and that is what we, we plan to do. So, uh, but as discerning people, as the specialists on the ground, mm -hmm. we want to be able to provide some consultation on some of those changes so that it has um, a, a more, you know, satisfactory impact mm -hmm. on students, less of an impact on students. Like we really feel that we know how it works on the ground. And so we are um, hopeful for those consultations to take place. Okay. So it have less of an impact. In our last minute here, let me ask you about one more thing, which is, and this has got a lot of attention, maybe a disproportionate amount of attention, the cell phone ban. Oh yes. How does it work <laughs> in your school? Do, do, they, do they actually, do you intend to ban cell phones in the classrooms now? So most schools, I mean, I can give you many examples of schools already have some kind of policy in place that actually bans or uh, bans cell phone during the instructional time. <laughs> and so a policy that I've had in place for many years is that it's at the discretion of the teacher. So if the, if the teacher says off and away during instructional time, the cell phone's off and away. And um, I, I think, I, you know, I don't actually think it's a bad thing to have it in the provincial policy, in the code of conduct. Mm. I, it does give schools leverage. I know that not all schools run the same way and, there's, and not all principals are the same either in what, you know, and how they would administer a policy that way. But having it in the provincial code of conduct to me is just a, an area of leverage for the principal so that uh, if they don't want the, the cell phones in the classroom, if that teacher uh, doesn't feel it's useful, that they're not using it as a tool or as a resource um, in the class, then it's off and away. They can say, sorry guys, my hands are tied. It's provincial edict. We got to do it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it does again, like, you know, it's up to the principal to enforce those uh, and to, to get the buy-in from the staff mm -hmm. um, to inv enforce those policies. But uh, absolutely. Gotcha. Well, mm -hmm. thanks for some insight into how you okay. do what you do. <laughs> That's Annalisa Verano, president of the Catholic Principals Council, Ontario. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.